The first uh, speaker is Manu Shankar Hari. He's a tenured consultant physician in intensive care medicine at Guy's and St. Thomas's uh, NHS Foundation Trust and at King's College in London. He is an, an expert on uh, a number of things, including uh, ARDS it's an, and its impact on sepsis, on immunology and on trial design. And without further ado, let me uh, turn uh, things over to him. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to kind of join this. And um, thanks all for the kind introduction. Um, my job is to uh, kind of start a brief overview of Oops, sorry, sepsis diagnosis, uh, the clinical and basic science of diagnosis and definition. Um, just as an acknowledgement to my funder, I'm funded through an NIHR uh, Clinician Scientist Award, and I do not have any uh, direct conflicts of interest for this talk. Just need to highlight that these are my views, not the National Health Service or the National Institute of Health Research UK or the Department of Health. So when I got asked to uh, do this uh, talk, um, I was wondering, um, how do I frame it? Um, why are we doing this? And to do that, um, the first thing that came to me is, uh, we are talking about infection and how certain are we about infection in the context of uh, sepsis definition? And I think that uncertainty um, is kind of variable between cases and within healthcare systems and between healthcare systems. And some of those issues need to be addressed if we were to kind of advance uh, the kind of sepsis outcomes. And I think a related uh, principle here is to understand that most of the infections that we see are uncomplicated infection. And uh, next week, Dr. Rudd may touch upon some of the issues where when they try to address the global burden of diseases, and only a proportion of these uncomplicated infections go on to develop uh, sepsis. So uh, just kind of recapping from the previous discussion, how do we know uh, which of those infections go on to develop sepsis? That's an important uh, point to address. And I think we all as clinicians and as healthcare professionals understand that there is probably less uncertainty when you at the bedside see an organ dysfunction. And I think the uncertainty is more around whether the organ dysfunction that you see in front of you is due to sepsis. Uh, let me give you a very simple example or caused by sepsis. Uh, let's consider somebody with chronic obstructive lung disease coming into hospital. They are in respiratory failure. So one of the questions that need addressing here is, is the respiratory failure caused due to an infected infection-related exacerbation or is it unrelated to an infection. So that's a kind of the causal reasoning that comes in in terms of organ dysfunction, which we haven't really addressed in any of the uh, definitions thus far. Uh, and I think uh, when you change all of those issues that I've highlighted require change of threshold of testing and diagnostic, diagnostic testing, which then may alter the epidemiology of the disease that you're uh, going to see. If you change the threshold of a test, this happened in myocardial infarction, when you change the troponin threshold, the incidence and the prevalence and the outcomes change, similar in cancer diagnostics. And I think these will be applicable to uh, sepsis diagnosis as well. And I think we may have an increase in incidence, decrease in incidence, or we may altogether identify something different as we change the diagnostic thresholds. And, and I think the, this, is a, this is important because when you change something with a test or a better test, what you start to see is a change in the risk of outcome. And I'm just going to give you a crude example. If we use mortality as an outcome and we treat patients with various interventions, the harms of any treatment is relatively constant across the baseline risk of death because most of the harms are related to the intervention itself. The benefits, however, may change as the risk of death changes. So somebody with a higher risk of death may benefit more from a particular treatment. And I think when we start to change the thresholds, we ought to keep uh, this issue in mind. A, a good example is the uh, activated protein C trial, uh, where FDA mandated us to do a, a, a kind of low risk of death population trial and we ended up unmasking some of the side effects of the intervention, in particular severe bleeding. So again, when we start to change the threshold, you ought to think about what it does 
to the current way of thinking and doing things. Right, so I've got around eight minutes to go through the sepsis definitions and criteria and a bit about the biology of sepsis. I'm going to focus on immunobiology as a starting construct and other, other elements will be picked up by other speakers later on. So sepsis has been around for a long time. What we currently use as the sepsis definition is sepsis 3.0. Uh, this kind of um, was preceded by sepsis 1 and sepsis 2 in 1991 and 2001. And there are a number of changes be between the uh, sepsis 2 and sepsis 3, very little in sepsis 1. And I just want to uh, kind of move to uh, sepsis 3. What we uh, what we did in sepsis three is um, we changed few elements of it. First element that we changed was sepsis three was one of the first attempts at the data driven criteria for uh, the clinical syndrome sepsis. So up until then, it wasn't data driven clinical criteria. We were essentially using some surrogate for organ dysfunction without actually uh, validating it. And sepsis 3 also did a few other things. We simplified the terminology. SERS as a concept was discarded partly because quite a lot of uh, predictive validity attributed to SERS um, wasn't uh, true. And um, second was patients, even patients in intensive care unit have SERS negative sepsis. And the term severe was discarded because organ dysfunction in itself uh, is the kind of crux of the problem and we use sepsis as an infection with organ dysfunction in the updated definition. And I think uh, septic shock was made, explicitly made as a subset of sepsis and this was because of the confusion in the literature. I'll come on to that in a moment. So just to recap the definitions of sepsis uh, three, which is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection, and the clinical criteria being suspected or proven infection with a change in SOFA score of two points or more. And if you were to compare it to old money, what sepsis three sepsis equates to roughly is sepsis two severe sepsis. So uh, that's a kind of the first major change. The second thing that happened is the septic shock definition. Now, this was uh, harder because um, at the time of redefining this, uh, we were kind of figuring out what the sepsis criteria were used, septic shock criteria were in vogue at the time. As you can see, there were a number of different criteria used in the old definitions to kind of operationalize the old definition. So what we did in uh, sepsis three septic shock, we defined the disease as a subset of sepsis in which there are circulatory abnormalities and cellular and metabolic abnormalities that increase your risk of death. And the corresponding criteria being that you need to, you need, you require vasopressor therapy to keep your mean arterial pressure greater than 65 and the serum lactate level is greater than two, even after adequate resuscitation. And the adequate was deliberately left undefined because it varies between settings and between clinicians and within patients. So with that sort of definition introduction, last few minutes on the sepsis biology with a focus on immunobiology. Um, I think the fundamentals are fairly uh, simple. We have three elements of immunobiology, avoidance, resistance, and tolerance. And in terms of resistance, the goal is to reduce pathogen burden. Tolerance is to reduce the negative impact of uh, infection on horse fitness. So just briefly, an infection is sensed by the immune system and the host response occurs and the host response is then translated into hopefully uh, an adaptive immune system response that is associated with the resolution of the clinical illness. And the sepsis tolerance uh, refers to four sub phenomena. Every tissue has got damage, susceptibility, has ability for repair, renewal, functional autonomy, and sequelae. Let's take the example of a lymphocyte, a simple white blood cell. The damage susceptibility is high, the renewal capacity is high, the damage sequelae is moderate to severe because it increases your risk of infection, secondary acquired infection. And I want to kind of make two simple points. First is the immune responses in sepsis are very, very different from infection. And these two studies 
are simple examples of a whole breadth transcriptome data that highlights the profound changes in the innate and adaptive immune system. And these, change, these examples will be picked up, uh, I'm hoping, in the, ne in the next few uh, talks. And the second point I'd like to make is, this, this came up in the earlier part of the discussion, I think sepsis immediately kind of brings us to bacterial infection. Unfortunately, it's not. There is enough and more uh, evidence uh, that you know viral infection leads on to a similar biological phenomenon that we kind of label as sepsis. And this is a paper from our group published recently in Nature Medicine. What I want you to focus on is the x-axis where we show uh, lower respiratory tract infection or LRTI and the low, moderate, and severe are COVID illnesses. As you can see, the cytokine profile is very similar. HLA-DR expression on monocytes, again, down regulation is similar. The B cell and T cell changes are very similar. And I think this is important to keep in mind that it, sepsis includes the viral infections, the viral pandemic that we are in is a form of viral sepsis. So what I've tried to do in the last 10 minutes is to frame the debate uh, that in an acutely unwell patient, uh, the things that we need to do are enhance the certainty of infection diagnosis. We need to identify the determinants of infection and determinants of sepsis in those who are infected and establish that the organ dysfunction that we are seeing is caused by infection. All of those things will be a big step forward uh, in our understanding and management of sepsis. Thank you. <laughs>